All right, so we are gonna go over the lecture for Wednesday. And those of you who have been following along the notes, um, where we ended on Friday is we were talking about Graham's law of effusion. That is, you can relate gases, the speed at which gases escape into a vacuum by their molecular weight. And then after that, we had a section on real gases. That is, how do we calculate how gases will behave if they're not ideal? Um, we're actually going to skip that for the sake of time. Um, and we're going to go on to our next section that is energy. And energy, we define that as the capacity to do work, right? So if you have energy, you can do work. But what is work? Work is force acting over a distance. So for example, if you have a person, and let me show you my awesome drawing skills. If you have a person and they have big muscles, right? And let's say they have a dumbbell, but all they're doing is holding the dumbbell. That is not work because they are not moving a force over a distance. However, if they start moving the dumbbell up and down, that is work because they are moving a distance. So remember that it's force over a distance. And we have different types of work that we talk about in chemistry and or rather different types of energy. And so we have work energy and we have heat energy. Heat energy is the flow of energy caused by temperature difference. Um, so for example, if I have a block of ice and a heater, they, I know they look the same. That's why I gave you what they are. And the heater is very hot and the ice isn't. Well, the heat from the heater will go directly into the ice and melt the ice because energy will flow from hot to cold. And when we talk about energy, we use some specific terms. So we have exothermic and endothermic. That is, is your system, so the system is the thing we are interested in studying. So let's say, in my example, our system is this block of ice, right? So if heat is um, being released into the environment, we call that exothermic. And the way I remember that is exo has the word exit. So if heat is exiting the system, that's exothermic. However, the system we have here is that the heat is going from the heater to the ice. So it's going in the system, it's endothermic, endo in. Right, so remember that work, heat, exothermic, and endothermic. And we can further break down energy. So we already talked about this at the very beginning of class or beginning of the semester. So we have kinetic energy, that is energy of motion. So we have billiard balls. This, this white cue ball is moving, so it has kinetic energy. We also have thermal energy, which is really just another type of kinetic energy. Um, it's the energy of temperature. Now, the reason why I said it's um, kinetic energy, because it's basically gas molecules hitting you. And how fast they hit you, we register that as hot or cold. So they hit you very slow. They take energy away from you when they hit you. They're cold. If they hit you really fast, they give you energy, they're hot. Now, we also have potential energy. That's energy with position or composition. So for example, if I have like a shelf and I have um, an iron on the shelf, or let's say, let's say a bag, because I just drew a bag. So I have a bag on the shelf and the ground is down here. Right now, that bag has potential energy, has energy stored up due to gravity. And if the energy in this, so this is potential up here, 
if this bag fell, that potential would be transferred into kinetic energy of movement. And for chemistry, we have what's called chemical energy, which is really just potential energy due to bonds. So if we look here at gasoline, um, let's say this is um, octanol. So I just drew octanol. Um, you don't need to know what this means until you get to organic chemistry. But basically, because of the bonds of octanol, it's very high energy. And so when you light it with fire, you're breaking that bonds and it starts a chain reaction where a bunch of bonds are going to be broken. So the energy is in the bond. That's what we call chemical energy. And it's similar to the bag on top of a shelf, right? It's energy stored up and we just have to give it a little push to let that energy release. For us, that push would be fire for our um, octanol. So we're just gonna start like we started our gas chapter and please um, take a minute, pause, Act like you were in class and try and solve this question. Um, we're just going to do some unit conversions. First, what if you go to Mickey D's and you buy a number one with a medium Dr. Pepper? Those of you who don't go to McDonald's, number one is the Big Mac combo. What I want you to do is take the unit of calorie, which we use for food, and convert it to kilojoules which is the energy we use for science, for, en for energy. Um, and if you go, next time you go to HEB, uh, look at the back. Sometimes you'll find that they have calories, one half kilojoules in another half. So uh, a lot of the rest of the world use kilojoules instead of calories for their food. But take a minute and see if you can calculate this. And hopefully you have calculated it and come back to the video and you're just not watching it straight through, waiting for me to give you the answer. Um, so let's do this conversion. I have 1,080 calories. One calorie is 4.104 joules. There's 1,000 joules, one kilojoule. Unit conversion. That is... 4, uh, 4.432 kilojoules. However, that, that dot's not supposed to be there, 4.4. However, it's kind of hard to like picture how much energy that is. So let's say I have an energy uh, efficient light bulb. I want to know um, that amount of energy, how many hours can I run that bulb if it's 23 watts per hour to run. So here's the convergence you need. Come back when you have it. And welcome back unless you didn't pause. So let's see, how, do, how can we solve this? So I know if I have 23 watts per hour and my final unit wants to be hour. Right? That's what I want to end up. How long can I run this light bulb? So I need time. So let's start with our calories because here, watts to hours, is a, that's how we can relate energy and time. So as long as I have my energy in watts, I can know how long I can run it. And here's my conversion between calories and watts. So I have 1,080 calories for every 0 0.860 calories, that's one watt. For every 23 watts, I can run that light bulb for one hour. Therefore, I can run this light bulb for 54.6 hours. So in, if you look at the recommendations, they say on a balanced diet, roughly 2000 calories, um, if you get half your calories from this one meal, that is enough energy to power one light bulb for 54 hours straight. So um, human body needs 
quite a bit of energy to run, as you can see from that. All right, now let's talk more uh, scientific lingo. Um, so when there's different ways to talk about energy, we're gonna talk about what's called internal energy. That is, if you combine kinetic and potential energy, that's all the energies that's in a system. And we actually can't calculate a number for like internal energy. It's hard to say like this system has so much energy. So what you'll usually see people talk about is a change in energy. Okay, I believe this is the first time we've seen delta all semester. So anytime you see this triangle, this is the Greek letter delta. Delta means change. And it's always the final state minus the initial state, right? So delta energy is your final you're looking at minus the initial energy you're looking at. And the reason we can do this type of calculation is that internal energy is what we call a state function. That is energy, the change in energy only depends on its final state and its initial state. It does not matter the path you took. So for example, my favorite example that I use every semester, we have a mountain and we have three hikers. Right now they have the same energy, their kinetic energy, let's say arbitrarily zero because they're not moving. Their potential energy is zero because they're on the ground. And they're gonna climb to the top of this mountain. Um, hiker one, he's just gonna climb up like the sheer rock. So it's gonna take a hammer, just climb up the sheer rock. Hiker two, she's gonna take the more conventional route and she's gonna do switchbacks all the way up to the top. Hiker three, they're super rich. They hire a helicopter. So again, some of my fun doodling here for you. That's actually not too bad. They're gonna hire a helicopter and they are gonna get a helicopter ride up to the top. All right, at the top of the mountain, let's say their potential energy is like a thousand kilojoules, right? Because they're way off the ground. Kinetic energy, zero. They're not, nobody's moving. Their change in potential, their internal energy was the same. Delta E equals final, a thousand minus initial, zero, right? They all did different paths, but all that matters is the final initial state. That is what we call a state function. And talking about energy, we're, I already mentioned this, but what we're interested in looking at at any given time, we call that the system and everything else in the universe is the surroundings. And if you remember the law of conservation of energy, energy cannot be destroyed or created. So if we're looking at a system and let's go back to, let me get better colors here. Let me go back to my ice block and my heater. Again, there are two cubes. So this is our system. And so everything else that's not the block is our surroundings. So any energy that flows into this ice had to come from the surroundings, which is the heater. So the change in energy of our system is equal to the negative change in energy of our surroundings, right? So if our ice absorbed 100 kilojoules of energy, well, that means the heater lost 100 kilojoules of energy, right? Because the heat flew in from the heater to the ice. 
and it's a conservation of energy. We can't just lose that energy. It has to go somewhere. Now, for chemistry purposes, when we talk about delta E, we talk about a chemical reaction, right? So if we talk about the combustion, whoops, O2, of methane, when we ask, you know, what is delta E? We're asking, what is the energy of the products? Because this is our final state, our products, minus the energy of the reactants. That's our initial state, reactants, right? So that's how we actually do it for chemistry. And that's how we're gonna talk about it. Um, later on, but right now we, let's just, we're gonna focus on just understanding this idea of system and surroundings. So here's a question for you. Um, you can't join this poll, but please make an answer before going on. If energy flows out of a chemical system into the surroundings, what is the sign of Delta E system? Is this endo or exo? All right. Heat's flowing out. Heat is exiting. It's exothermic. If heat is exiting my system, I lose heat. Heat is negative. All right, so the answer here is exothermic and negative. All right. So if the internal energy of the products of a reaction is higher than the internal energy of the reactants, well, don't mean to be drawn there, sorry. What is the sign of delta E? Is this endo or exo? So remember, reactants go to products. So if the internal, so the energy is higher here then what is delta E and is that endo or exo? So remember, I talked about this on the previous page. Delta E for a chemical reaction is products minus reactants. So if the products is a bigger number, delta E has to be positive. And let's think about what this means. Again, we can go back to our ice cube. So if delta E is positive, that means heat or energy has to be flowing into it. Since it's going in it, it's endothermic. So the correct answer here is that this is endothermic and it's positive. Now, We've been talking about energy being exchanged between the system and the surroundings. And at the very beginning of this lecture, I talked about heat and work, right? Different types of energy. Well, let's go back to this idea now. When we talk about a change in energy, like I said, it's hard to measure the energy of a system. I can't just look at a cat and say, I know how much energy is in that cat. But we can calculate heat and work of, of a particular system. And one thing to note, a minor point, is that heat and work are not state functions. So going back to the mountain example of our three hikers, right? The change in energy at the end of the day is going to be the same. But some people did a lot more work than others. So that can be different. Work and heat are different based on the path you take. So let's look at some examples here to make sure we understand these concepts. So we have a rolling billiard ball, right? So we, we have one ball that's going to be moving. That hits another ball. When that does, the first ball, whoops, first ball stops. 
second ball moves. I want to know, is this heat or is this work? And what is the sign of delta E if number one's our system? All right, pause the video, go back to the notes, make sure you understand what I mean by heat and work and how to define that. And then, then see if you can figure this out. And welcome back if you did pause. And welcome if you're still watching this video. And welcome if you are listening to me at 1.5 or 2x the speed of a normal voice. So let's see here. First off, let's do delta E because I think that that we talked about that already. So if this first ball is hitting another one and stopping, it is giving the energy to the second ball when the second ball can move. So since it's giving energy away, the change in energy of our first ball is negative. We lost that energy. The question is that heat or work energy. And this is work because that billiard ball, if you remember work is force times a distance. This billiard ball was moving across a distance and then it hits this ball and it launches that across a distance. So it, it hit it with some force over a distance, that is work. Heat is temperature. Basically, if you see energy changing due to a, change, a difference in temperatures, that's heat. If you're seeing things move because a distance or a volume is involved and there's no mention of temperature, then that's work. Okay, how about this? Book falls to the floor. The book's the system. Does this here work? What's the sign of delta E? So again, take a minute to think about this and come back when you have it and I'll start drawing it now. The book falls to the floor. So it loses the potential energy, right? That goes to kinetic. And then it's going to hit the ground and it's going to lose all kinetic, all potential. And so we can say, you know, E is basically zero. So that means we lost energy because we had potential energy up here when we were on the shelf. We had kinetic energy when we we're moving and then energy went to zero when we hit the ground. And again, this is work because we are not doing any heat here. Last one, father pushes his daughter on the swing. Daughter and the swing are the system. It says here to work. And so the answer for this, if the daughter having a fun time on the swing, yay. All right, so I'm a daughter's on a swing and she's getting pushed. So that means that the per person pushing her with his arrow hands is giving energy to the daughter on the swing. So the daughter on the swing is gaining energy. That's why they're moving. And since they're, they're a force moving across the distance, that would be work. All right. So that ends this PowerPoint. I'm gonna do a little more of the next PowerPoint to try and catch up here. Not all of it, um, but just um, a few, few things for PowerPoint 21, which was supposed to be for today anyways. And now we're going to talk about heat, right? So we mainly been focusing on work in the last slide, uh, slideshow. Let's go to heat. And we're going to talk about heat capacity, right? Heat capacity is how much energy does it take to heat something up, right? So think about different heat capacities. Water has a very high heat capacity. If you put water on the stove, it takes a long time to boil. 
However, aluminum or steel or whatever pan you have holding the water, that has a very low heat capacity. That heats up very well. So low heat capacity, capacity means heat up very fast. Or cool down very fast. Basically, it's your capacity to hold on to heat. All right. And water is very good. Steel's not. Also, asphalt and grass. Um, on a summer day, 110 degrees. I had this in the reading guide. Which one would you rather step on? Asphalt or grass? It's always amazing to me how many people say asphalt. I don't know why. Have you never tried that barefoot? It hurts a lot during the summer because asphalt has a very low heat capacity. Grass is mainly water. So it has a very high heat capacity, right? So that's what heat capacity is. How fast do you heat up or cool down? And specific, well, specific heat capacity is a number we can give to a substance that mathematically we can use to calculate how fast we heat up or cool down. And the unit for heat capacity is joules gram centigrade, all right? Weird unit, but let's, let's talk about specific heat capacity. Maybe it'll make more sense. Specific heat capacity is the amount of heat required. So that's joules, heat required, to raise the temperature of one gram, that's why grams in the units, by one degree centigrade or Celsius. So that's why temperature is in there. So for example, water. For one gram of water, I have to give 4.18 joules of energy to raise it by one degree centigrade, right? That's what these numbers mean. We also have something called a molar heat capacity. Molar heat capacity is simply how much energy I have to put in to raise the temperature of one mole of substance by one degree C. So specific heat capacity is one gram. Molar heat capacity is one mole. And heat energy, we talked about heat is Q in the previous PowerPoint, but let's actually talk about how we calculate heat. And Q equals MCS delta T, right? So how much heat of an object is proportional to its mass and the specific heat uh, capacity and the temperature change it goes through. So if we think about this, if I have 100 grams of water and the specific heat capacity of water is a constant for water, if I want to go from 0 to 100, that is ice from uh, 0 degrees water to 100 degrees water, that takes a lot of energy compared to I only want to go from zero to 20. Makes sense. The greater temperature range I want to go, the more energy I have to put in. Or let's just say I want to go from zero to 100. And I want to do this for 100 grams versus 1,000 grams. Based on this mathematical equation, it says it takes less energy to heat up 100 grams of water than it does 1,000. Again that should make sense, right? So this equation is simply telling us how much heat we need to, uh, sorry, that heat is related to mass, specific heat capacity, and the temperature change of an object. And it's in that equation. And we're gonna look at how to use this equation and hopefully you'll get more comfortable with it then. So here's where we're gonna stop after doing this question. So try and do this question, and then um, on Friday, we'll pick it up from here, right? So I have 250 milliliters of water. It's at 37 degrees Celsius. I lose 342 joules of energy. What's delta T? 
density of water is given there. So this one will probably actually take you like, depending on how fast you are, anywhere from three to six, seven minutes. Pause, come back when you have it. And let's take a look at how we solve this. So let's look at our variables here and see what we have. Q, heat is in joules, is our energy. It loses 342. So we have lost 342. So Q is negative 342. And that is equal to my mass. Well, I have a volume, but I don't have a mass, but I have a density that says for every one gram, or sorry, one, mil, one gram per milliliter. So if I have 250 milliliters for every one milliliter, that's one gram, which means my mass is 250. My CS constant, delta T is T final minus T initial. Initially, I'm at 37. So what I'm trying to figure out is what is my final temperature? And so when you do the math for this, you get that your final temperature is 36.7 degrees. Makes sense. We lost heat, so heat went down. All right, that's where we will end it. If you have questions about that, please um, email me, let me know. Um, otherwise, I hope to see you all soon. Um, yeah, and have a good rest of your Wednesday or whatever day you are watching this. Have a good one.